Good morning. I am so happy to see everyone here today. So I am Judy Postmas, the Dean of our School of Social Work, and I am so pleased to welcome all of you joining us online this morning for our 26th Daniel Thurs Social Justice Lecture. Welcome to our alumni, current faculty, staff, and students. Particularly, I also want to welcome our, all members of our broader community as we work side by side to improve all areas of social justice. I'm particularly pleased to celebrate this morning's Thurs lecture, which is twofold. The first part, we're focusing on Ableism 101, affirming practice with disabled people and people with disabilities, and two, inclusive health and medical advocacy for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. I am thrilled personally that these topics are a part of this lecture, since many of us, myself included, struggle with invisible and visible challenges to our abilities every day. The Daniel Thurs Social Lecture Series is an integral part of that commitment to social justice. Dean Thurs was a social work scholar, leader, activist, and dean, and this lecture series honors his vision of collaborative partnerships and service. His family, colleagues, and friends established the endowed professorship and this lecture series to honor his example and his vision. I'm honored to know that I believe his grandson, Alex Blaywise, and his wife, Rose, are joining us today. So welcome, and if there's any other family members, welcome to you as well. This event is hosted by Professor Corey Shidema as our Thurs professor. As befitting her professional background, Corey Shidema is a scholar who focuses on how people work in and around policies that are unjust and ineffective in different substantive areas, such as child welfare, prostitution, and child care policy. She is dedicated to ensuring that the legal institutions, policies, and programs designed to assist those most affected, work well with those on the front line, and that their voices are heard. Her dual background in law and social work has facilitated this research, both in her understandings of court proceedings and laws, and in gaining access to a wide variety of legal venues. Professor Shadema brings to her teaching both her social work scholarly training and her legal background, a powerful disciplinary perspective for social work educators. Her experience abroad in Israel, her deep affection for our students, and the school's commitment to social justice for all are the reasons she holds the position of the third distinguished professor of social justice. And I am thrilled that she and the team who have been working on this topic for two years to bring this forward for us to have here today. Um, and more than welcome and, and excited to see what's going to happen today. So welcome, Professor Shadema. Thank you so much, um, Dean Postmas, for your very um, kind welcome. Uh, we are grateful for your ongoing support um, and for the Thurs Endowment that does enable us to bring these lectures to our UMB School of Social Work community. I'd also like to share my gratitude for the support of Shante Hatcher, Anita Bryant, and Isabel Garcia for their ongoing support of the Thurs Lecture Series. As many of you know, part of my vision for this series is to highlight topics and areas that have important social justice implications, as Dean Postmas has shared, but that we may not cover as fully as we would like to in our curriculum. They're also an opportunity for us to dialogue with our broader community, bringing together students, faculty, staff, alumni, supporters, and community partners to reflect and learn. Today's social justice lecture is one such opportunity. The first part of today's lecture, Ableism 101, Affirming Practice with Disabled People, People with Disabilities, by its title, is already providing us with important concepts to consider, such as the language that we use, particularly identity language, when we talk about and to people. It is particularly gratifying that this first part of our workshop was created by two of our very own UMB School of Social Work graduates and one current student, soon to be a graduate, all of whom as students and active members of the Dream Disability Justice Student Group identified a need in our school for greater awareness and training. Together with Samantha Fold as faculty advisor, they worked to themselves address this need to the benefit of our whole school community and others. The second part of today's workshop similarly grows out of the experiences of athletes from Special Olympics of Maryland navigating healthcare systems and providers. As part of their advocacy efforts, 
they connected with UMB and are providing trainings across the different schools on campus. We are grateful to partner with these community voices for a robust dialogue about the role of social workers and the social work profession in providing and advocating for affirming and supportive care for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. What our program today makes abundantly clear is that it is neither just nor effective to provide services, develop programs, or make policy without the involvement of those who are most impacted by these. So um, I would, um, oops, sorry, my screen is blocking my work. Our MC for today's program is Samantha Fold. Dr. Fold is clinical assistant professor here at the School of Social Work. Her focus is promoting neurodiversity affirming care in social work education and practice. She is also a wonderful colleague, advocate, and educator. Dr. Fold will first will introduce the first part of our workshop, which is a panel presentation that will run until about 1020, and that will be followed by 10 minutes for Q&A. After that, we're going to take a five minute break. Dr. Fold will then introduce our next panelist, who will also speak for about an hour, followed by 10 minutes of Q&A, after which I will come back to bid you farewell. Because we have a packed agenda and limited time for Q&A, the panelists will also actively be managing and responding in the chat. So we encourage you to use that function if you would like to ask questions. So with much appreciation and admiration, I now pass the baton to Dr. Fold. Thank you so much, Dr. Stema, and welcome everyone. It is such an honor to be here sure, this morning. She's 10 years old and to introduce you all to this fabulous team who will lead you through an exploration of unpacking ableism, particularly as it shows up in the context of social work. Guiding this training will be Dana Cobrin, Mary McKelvey, and Libby Ness. And as you'll see in their bios, both Dana and Mary are social workers and alumni of the School of Social Work, as Dr. Stema had mentioned, and Libby is a current student at the Shady Grove campus. Um, and again, I know Dr. Stema also let you know just a little bit that this training was actually developed out of an independent study course on ableism and disability justice that the three of them undertook last spring as MSW students. And I had the privilege, along with my colleague Gail, Gail Betts, of advising that course. So it's lovely to see this really coming to fruition today. These three truly exemplify what it means to engage in advocacy, critical inquiry, and justice, and it is a privilege to have them here to share their wisdom this morning. So without further ado, Dana, Libby, Mary, take it away with Ableism 101. Thank you so much, Dr. Fold. And while Mary pulls up our presentation that we'll share today, um, I'll just get us started a little bit. It's, it's so exciting to see everybody here. Um, my name is Libby Ness. I'm one of the co-facilitators of uh, Dream Disability Justice. Um, and it's my pleasure to get us started with the ableism portion of today's presentation. And as there's been a lot of gratitude expressed, we have a little bit more <laughs> we'd like to share. Um, and one of those is to, to really thank you all for being here today. And then also to thank the people who have made this possible. So to Dr. Steima for the invitation to be here, uh, to the late Daniel Thurs and his family for help, helping make and continue to make this community learning space possible, to Ms. Shante Hatcher and the Office of Continuing Education for all of their logistical support, to Dean Donner and the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the School of Social Work, to Jillian Ginsburg and Sheena Oji, our current DREAM co-leaders at the School of Social Work, to research librarian extraordinaire Gail Betts and Dr. Samantha Fold for their unwavering support and encouragement, um, and to the incredible team from Special Olympics Maryland for, that's really made this such a collaborative and joy-filled process. It really, it takes a village. 
to get here today and we just appreciate all of your support. Mary, would you like to advance? And so before we really dive in, we'd love to take a moment to check in with ourselves. Um, you may be able to make out one of those very small words on this feeling wheel, or maybe you feel more like one of the colors, or maybe there's an emotion that you're feeling that matches one of those squiggly faces on the screen, or maybe you don't feel like connecting with anything on the screen at all. Whatever it is, we invite you to just take a moment to settle into this space, uh, and there will be moments throughout today's program that prompt us to check in with ourselves around certain issues or a question. Um, and it, if it feels comfortable for you at those times, please do check in with your body as well. Next, we'll look at some community guidelines. We're, I'm sure all pretty much professional at this by now, but um, if you can, please keep your microphone muted. Uh, if you have a question, feel free to put that in the chat. We'll be taking a look at that, but we'll also have time at the end for Q&A. Uh, and take breaks. It's a long uh, presentation today, so feel free to turn off your camera when you need to, get some water, have a snack, take care of your spirit. Um, and please, there'll be some contact information at the end if there's anything that we can do to make this training more accessible. Uh, please do let us know. We're always wanting to incorporate that feedback. All right, so as was mentioned before, this is a presentation um, that is a culmination of over two years of work. Um, from 2020 to 2022, uh, Dana, Mary, and I were the co-chairs of Disability Justice at the University of Maryland Baltimore School of Social Work. Um, and together we saw that through our courses and curriculum, uh, there was missing some pretty necessary content regarding disabilities and how to support people with disabilities as social workers. Um, so we came together and again, with that help from Dr. Fold and Gail Betts, we created an alternative. Uh, Dana really spearheaded the development of a curriculum that we presented to the master program committee. Then we created an independent study where we covered the content and curriculum uh, we developed under the leadership of Dr. Fold and Gail. And that ended in a final project. And that's this workshop that discussed ableism and disability justice. We presented a shorter version of this to the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee last year. And DREAM has also worked with ESDS, which is the Educational Support and Disability Services, to create an informational document outlining how to receive accommodations for the LMSW licensing exam and sort of what that process looks like overall. And all of that brings us to today with this presentation and the career paths that it's inspired. Dana Cobrin uses she, her pronouns. She is an alum of UMB, the School of Social Work, and is now a supported employment specialist at the Jewish, Jewish Community Services in Baltimore, Maryland, where she assists with career coaching, case management, and community programming for people with disabilities. My name's Libby, I use she, her pronouns. I'm a student of the University of Maryland School of Social Work, where I serve as a co-facilitator of Dream Disability Justice, and I'm a Sudif scholar focusing on holistic treatment of substance use disorders. And I serve as the uh, education and outreach coordinator at the Common Market Co-op in Frederick, Maryland. And Mary McKelvey uses they, them pronouns. Mary's an alum also of University of Maryland, Baltimore, School of Social Work, and is now a psychotherapist at the Maryland Center for Gender and Intimacy in Frederick, Maryland, where they provide individual and group therapy to neurodivergent, transgender, and gender expansive people. And in this next slide, we'll take a look at uh, Dream's mission statement very briefly. This comes from the Constitution um, that is 
housed under the Student Government Association. And we'll just highlight that as a student group, we are really trying to create an inclusive and supportive community to promote disability justice at the University of Maryland and in all of our separate communities. And we try to do that by engaging individuals with disabilities and their allies in respectful and compassionate discourse during our meetings and things like that in order to promote awareness and inclusion of disability on campus. And we're always trying to foster that respect, respectful and inclusive environment. And we welcome and encourage everyone to self-identify and use language that reflects and honors your experience. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later. DREAM was created by Courtney Bergen, Katie Savage, and Megan Sidhu, who are previous students. This was before the pandemic. And we're just really honored to be able to continue that work today. All right, so what to expect from us as facilitators? We are going, we're always striving to have an intersectional approach and consider our positionality as facilitators. We are approaching this through critical analysis and, and in a hope to understand our power more clearly and how those systems create uh, uh, power dynamics. We're going to be centralizing disability in order to frame ableist, narr reframe ableist, narr ableist narratives. I should have done some, some uh, warm ups before <laughs> jumping on. And we're always gonna try to be here and now, recognizing our limitations as facilitators and um, always looking to expand those for ourselves. And so just a brief note on positionality that I mentioned before, the three of us are all dedicated to collectively creating a brave meeting and learning space here and in other areas of our lives. And it is always our intention to center marginalized communities, identities, and ways of being. And as three white people with various intersecting identities, we recognize the power and privilege we hold in this space and recognize the ways in which our privileges may intersect with that information that we share today. We have diligently worked to ensure this uh, introduction to ableism and disability justice is intersectional in its approach. And again, always welcome feedback. And so now we'll look at what to expect from this training. So uh, as participants, we hope that you'll acquire language here to discuss ableism and disability justice um, in order to, to build some comfort and ease when talking about these issues. We will critically examine social constructs of disability, understanding that these systems and environments lead to barriers to access and inclusion. We'll examine and explore our personal bias so that we can disrupt these narratives. Um, and it's important to note that personal or implicit bias is always connected to systemic and institutional systems of oppression, which are those disabling environments. Overemphasis on individual bias can sometimes deflect attention from those policies that reinforce oppression and can sort of overemphasize the problem on individuals. So while recognizing and unlearning bias is absolutely critical. We also have to remember that we too are a person in an environment and how we can disrupt those systems as well. And by unlearning and reimagining, we'll explore ways to advocate and, and consider paths towards allyship and accessibility on a broader scale. And today's roadmap, shows in finer detail where we'll travel today. We'll look at language. We'll look at a social worker's perspective. And again, you may be here and you're not a social worker. That's great. We, we welcome that. And we're so excited that you're here because all of these things are easily applicable in other fields and, and should be considered as well. Uh, we'll look at disability justice and in intersectionality, disability as a social construct, explore that ableism and personal or implicit bias, and then end with hope. I think that's really important always. 
is to make sure that we're imagining those hopeful futures and um, exploring ideas for everyday accessibility. So first off, language matters. Um, and this is just a, a, a brief introduction to that idea of person first and identity first language. There's um, also a, a handout or a link that's in re the registration link for more information if you'd like to uh, explore this further. But um, in order to foster a respectful and inclusive environment, we are always like we mentioned in that uh, dream constitution, we're always welcoming people to use language that reflects and honors their experience. And we, and by doing so, we have to also recognize that there are different ways and different preferences that people use to identify themselves within the disability community. And so we'll take a look at this person first language. Person first really emphasizes the person rather than their disability or identity. And an example of that would be to say uh, a person with a disability rather than a disabled person. And then on the other side of that is that identity first language, which emphasizes how disability plays in a very important role in a person's identity and can also frame disability as a positive piece of their lives. So an example might be someone identifying an, as, as an autistic person rather than a person with autism. And as is true of so many things, if you're unsure because it was unclear how a person would like to be identified. Libby, you are muted. We cannot hear you. Oh, I'm back. Sorry about that. Thank you so much. I think I was able to mute the other thing too. So I'm so sorry. Where did I leave off? Where were you here till? You were talking about identity first language. Carry on. Okay. Thank you ever so, Dana. So identity, identity, identity first language, putting that identifier in front, like a, as an example of saying an autistic person rather than a person with autism. And just as is important with basically everything else, um, and how you build relationships, it's always important to ask. Um, that's the, the best thing to do. Um, and so as a quick check-in, uh, you'll see this box here in this bottom left corner. This is uh, one of those, the first examples of, of our, our self-reflecting check-in. Um, and so no need to put this into the chat. Um, you can if you feel comfortable and no need to unmute or share, but really just to take a moment to think about after hearing about person first and identity first language, which feels most comfortable to you. Um, maybe that's interactions that you've had um, or language that you use for yourself. And then thinking too, um, why might someone else choose to use different language? from what you would prefer. Um, so again, just take a moment to think about that. Good morning, everybody. How are you? And now we'll move on. Maybe we should just take a moment, to just check to make sure that you're muted because I'm hearing a little bit of some feedback. Um, and I'm like, squirrel, so. <laughs> Okay, so now let's just take a, a quick moment um, as to what makes social work practice affirming. And again, like focusing that individual piece. So this is gonna look different um, wherever you are. And so these are just some ideas that we've had um, that can lead to more affirming practice. So it's important to remember that disability is only one facet of an individual's lived experience and using an intersectional and that individualized approach always is helpful to supporting anybody that you're working with. And so one way to do that is to centralize each person's individual experience. We are all the experts of our own experience, our own life and, um, and how disability does or does not affect us. 
This gives us another opportunity to reflect on power. We as social workers are not gatekeepers who hold all of the knowledge and to really um, be sure that we're aware of that power dynamic that is always in place when you are working with other people. It's important to use language that the individual you are working with prefers, like we just talked about, language matters, and to ask which terms they prefer and how they understand their experience with their disability. And as we grow in our knowledge, we'll come to understand that there are ways to challenge ableism daily. Um, some very important ones and just good all around things to have in your back pocket is to make sure that you're not speaking over someone um, and to never speak for a disabled person unless they explicitly ask you to do so. Again, kind of understanding that power. And then it's so important to enable, normalize talking about disability, disability justice, accessibility, and ableism with clients, colleagues, and supervisors. And the only way to practice that really is to do it. And so now it is my pleasure to pass the baton to Mary, um, who will dive into more of a detailed look into the social work perspective. Thanks, Lib. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for, so much for being here with us this morning. Um, I am, I'm sharing my screen and also doing this. So if, if um, anything gets confusing, I apologize in advance. Is every, it seems like everyone's able to see the presentation fully and that there's no problem with like my, my screen. Okay, good. All right. So like Libby said, obviously, right, not everybody here is going to be a social worker, and that's okay. We're so glad that you're here hanging out with us this morning to, to talk about something that the three of us, and I know a lot of other people are extremely passionate about, which is um, disability justice, right? And even, even saying the word disability sometimes is jarring for people, and that should not be the case, right? We need to normalize having these conversations and normalize um, normalize being able to like communicate with folks with uh, various disabilities or um, uh, various identity markers, right? And so what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about um, the social work, our, our perspective as social workers, um, and then I'm going to get into disability justice, talk a little bit about intersectionality, and then like kind of define disability a little bit more for us in a broader sense, because understanding disability through a disability justice lens is not um, the only way to understand um, how disability affects uh, people and how society affects people with disabilities more, more specifically. Um, and so I just want everyone to kind of keep that in mind that, um, that there are multiple ways of, of thinking about this, this, um, this con these concepts um, and this topic. Um, and for us, we've taken kind of a disability justice lens. But anyway, to start, so the National um, uh, the National Association of Social Workers, right, um, says that a historic and defining feature of social work is the profession's dual focus on an individual well-being in social context, as well as the well-being of society. Um, and this is really important to remember, especially considering um, how dis disability, a uh, disabling environment affects people with disabilities, right? And instead of just focusing on a person with a disability as like that part of their identity is what makes things difficult for them. If we understand that the environment itself is disabling, um, it puts pressure on those, those systems that Libby was talking about, right? There are like multiple systems working in hand in hand with each other um, that ultimately affect individuals' ability to live full and um, fulfilling lives. Um, so some of the, uh, the key tenants of social work, right, where, uh, are, that are outlined in our code of ethics are service, social justice, dignity and worth of a person, importance of human relationships, integrity and competence. And so in focusing on all of those, um, all, all of those ethical codes, right, 
and those principles and those values. It's important for us to remember as social workers, it is actually our duty um, to support and centralize people with disabilities and um, disabled people's experiences and voices. Um, it's our ethical responsibility to do this work. Um, and it is necessary to encourage these kind of conversations so that when we are in an office space, when we are in session with clients, when we are out in the community providing the supports that, um, that we are trained to do right at the School of Social Work, that we're able to talk explicitly and openly and also to be um, accepting, understanding, and um, and recognizing right that we do not hold all of the knowledge. The people that we support hold the knowledge, just like Libby had said earlier. Um, it's necessary to centralize these voices and experiences um, and to normalize these conversations. And the last thing, as social workers, uh, we pride ourselves in challenging our personal bias, right? What part of part of our training um, in the beginning of our program is to kind of look at our views um, and to look at what brought us into social work in the first place, right? And a lot of times that is uh, recognizing the ways that our identities intersect and recognizing the ways that we operate within um, systems of oppression and challenging the the power dynamics that we hold um, and the privileges that we hold. And so th this just says personal bias, but it means personal bias. This is a typo. I'm sorry about that. But um, unlearning and challenging personal bias is necessary as social workers. And I think as, as people in a an extremely diverse and uh, beautiful community, world community, right, it's necessary to recognize the ways in which our privilege affects other people and um, yeah, so I'm going to tell us a little bit about disability justice. <clears throat> and again, this is just our own. Um, this is this is the the understanding of, of disability that that we take as a as a group. I'm going to get into a little bit more a little bit later on different definitions of disability. But disability justice, um, and this is a this is information from Project Let's, but it has radical roots. Um, it's uh, a, the term was coined out of conversations between disabled queer women of color in 2005, Patty Byrne of Sins Invalid, Mia Mingus, and Stacy Milburn, who eventually united with Leroy Moore, Eli Clare, and Sebastian Margaret. Uh, and they sought to challenge radical and progressive movements to more fully address ableism. So um, this disability justice was um, a movement that came out of the disability rights movement. And instead of looking at disability in like a medical model or, um, or a social model, it was focusing more on identity, right? Disability, not just as something that occurs to a person that is medicalized, but it is an, ex, uh, an explicit and extremely important part of someone's identity. Um, and so that's kind of where disability justice comes from. It's also extremely necessary to think about disability justice as an intersectional part of who a person is, right? So disability justice recognizes the intersecting legacies of white supremacy, colonial capitalism, gendered oppression, and ableism in understanding how people's bodies and minds are labeled deviant, unproductive, disposable, or invalid. And that's really kind of what we're getting at with this training is being able to have the conversations that are necessary to challenge these views. Later on in our presentation, Dana is gonna talk a little bit more about ableism and accessibility. Um, and then we're gonna hand, hand pass the torch, pass the baton, I think is, is, is what we've been saying in this, in this uh, presentation. And then we're gonna pass the baton to Special Olympics Maryland to talk about their experiences and the ways that like the medical field has affected has affected them as um, and so it's really important right to recognize that these narratives affect how people live their lives right and or affect people's ability to live their full lives and so in challenging like those larger social structures and larger systems we're able to kind of provide or at least have the potential to provide an opportunity for people um, to explore their their own their own privilege and their own oppression, right? And it and it happens in an intersectional way. Um, and that's kind of what 
we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about next, right? An intersectional analysis of ableism and disability justice. So being able to recognize disability as only one facet of a person's identity, right? Recognizing that disability is something that affects a person's life. And also just like sometimes um, race, sexuality, gender, uh, sexual orientation, uh, religion, any of these other, uh, other defining factors of a person's life each day is different, right? Like some days I feel like extremely queer. Some days I feel like extremely white and I'm like very aware of my privilege or my oppression depending upon those days. And it's the same thing with, with neurodivergence or disability generally, right? It's a part of somebody's identity. Um, and so some days that part of uh, someone's identity is more important and other times it is, it is not. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it's really important to remember that a person is complex. Disability is not the only thing about a person, just like race is not the only thing about a person, just like sexuality is not the only thing about a person, right? And so that's going to be really important as we go through this training and as we start introducing different concepts and topics and stuff like that for folks to remember that um, a person with a disability or um, an autistic person or a person with a mental illness, right, um, all of those people at the end of the day are just people. Um, and I think that that's kind of what we're getting to um, is recognizing that, yes, there are systems of power that affect people's ability to live full lives. And also it's necessary to centralize the, the humanity of a person, right? Um, so again, this is this is kind of the same, the same thing that I was just saying. Um, intersectionality, right? Disability is a facet of an individual um, and collective identity, just like race, gender, sexuality, age, religion, and any other aspect of human diversity. Ableism also um, can have intersectional boundaries that intertwine due to economic resources, structural barriers, and more. Um, so recognizing disability as a facet of individual experience um, and also recognizing that ableism itself compounds with or, or interacts with white supremacy culture, right, or, or um, colonial capitalism, um, all of those things intersect. So there's a check-in here. I want to offer an opportunity for everyone to take a few minutes to think about intersectionality and how might different intersecting identities affect a person's access to resources, right? And this is something you don't have to type in the chat or unmute yourselves, as Libby was saying before. This is just an opportunity for you to reflect and think about how this might be affecting people's lives. And again, right, we're going to talk about what the word disability means. We didn't even, we didn't even go there yet. Um, and language holds a lot of power in our society, right? So if we understand disability in a certain way, it's going to, that narrative is going to affect how people, how people are able to live their lives. So again, this is another opportunity just to check in. What does the word disability mean to you? What feelings come up when you consider disability? Do you feel comfortable discussing disability? Um, and again, just take a couple of seconds to reflect on those questions. Feel free to write down uh, some of your thoughts that come up. Um, no need to put them in the chat, but just kind of self-reflect. Uh, do whatever feels best for you. So we can dive into a couple of different definitions, right? I was discussing that they're the, the way that Dana Libby and myself have come to conceptualize disability as part of like an identity. Um, there is a long and varied history of the disability rights movement. And that is not what this presentation is today. This is just like a, an overview. Um, the, the hope is that you will, you will come out of this with lots of questions um, and then you get to go and do some fun and exciting research and then you can contact us and we can keep the conversation going. That's the goal. Um, so these are just, uh, this is just an overview, right? There, there are many different ways to consider disability and how it affects people's lives. Um, so what is disability? Is it an impairment? Um, there are different definitions, right? So a disability 
has been defined as uh, is any condition of the body or mind impairment, right? That makes it more difficult for the person with the condition to do certain activities, activity limitation, and to interact with the world around them participation restrictions. And so this is a definition from the CDC. Um, and so this definition focuses on disability as an impairment that um, it makes, it's a medical condition that affects a person's uh, ability to interact with their environment. Is disability a limitation? Uh, the ADA defines a person with a disability as a person who has a physical or mental impairment, again, the same language, uh, that substantially limits one or more major life activity. And this includes people who have a record of such an impairment, even if they do, even if they do not currently have a disability. Um, so again, understanding disability as a limitation or an impairment. Um, uh, is disability an identity? And right, I kind of already, the cat's already kind of out of the bag. That's part, that's partially how we pers we personally understand disability. And again, we invite everyone to have their own understanding of, of what disability is and, and is not to them. Um, so disability, um, this is this is a quote from, from Alice Wong. Um, disability is mutable, ever evolving. Disability is both apparent and non-apparent. Disability is pain, struggle, brilliance, abundance, and joy. Disability is socio-political, it's cultural, and it's biological. Being visible and claiming a disabled identity brings risks as much as it brings pride. So this conceptualization, right, is really focused on identity and how a person experiences um, disability as part of who they are, right, and it's, and it's in relation to the environment. Um, it's not just explicitly part of themselves, it's also a social construct, right? Um, disability is human diversity. Again, the ADA defines a person with a disability um, as a person with physical and mental impairment. Um, and it's part of, again, this is, this, is not, this is not on the slide, but disability as part of human diversity, the same way that it is an identity. Um, so like we covered, there are, there's a significant variety of definitions for the word disability and, and models for conceptualizing disability. This is just, again, broad strokes here. Um, but the most important thing to remember is that disability is part of a person's identity and lived experience. And for us as social workers um, and for people who support people with disabilities or disabled people in, in their work or in their lives, in their families, their friends, any of, any of these fields, it's necessary to centralize a person's experience and their own voice and, and their opinions. Um, and so, uh, there's another opportunity for a personal check-in. Does any of this information change your conceptualization of disability? Does this change your perception of people with disabilities? And so take a couple of seconds to reflect on that. And, um, and now I am going to pass the baton to my friend Dana. I'm so sorry. I, I just, I really did start the pass the baton, I think, because we've been spending so much time with Special Olympics Maryland, and it's just like at the front of my my mind, so. I really, I feel like Dr. Stein also said it, so it's it's all. Okay, good. All, all right. All there. <laughs> I will take us home for the latter part of our presentation, as Mary and Libby have so eloquently put so far. So the one thing I want to say before we keep going is you're getting so many terms thrown at you. I, sometimes I don't even remember the exact definitions because they can mean so many things. So we have an amazing handout that was sent out with this presentation with resources. Take a look at that now and take a look at that um, at the end, because if you don't remember all the terms, it's okay. We're all human. It's a lot of language and communication, but just we our goal is an intro to have you explore. So ableism, what does it actually mean? And there's so many facets to that. So I just wanted to highlight on the check-in, what does it mean to you? what feelings come up when you think about it? And finally, how comfortable do you feel discussing it? Because I want to differentiate there's a difference between thinking about it and your own personal feelings and actually having conversations about it and being able to communicate with others about what you think about it. 
So here's some definitions that will help you conceptualize a little bit. Ableism is a form of discrimination. And from the University of Arizona Disability Resource Center, um, it is discrimination and oppression of disabled people and societal beliefs that being abled is normal and preferred. It's kind of like thinking of it as a dichotomy that we have put on a pedestal, um, what should look like in terms of the society and anybody that has a disability um, would be discriminated against and considered not as preferred or differently. And another definition from the Barnard Center for Research on Women it is a system of oppression that favors being able-bodied and able-minded at any cost, frequently at the expense of people with disabilities. So expanding on the discrimination a little bit, it's kind of an oppression that this is the preferred way we want to look at it. And if you are not this way, then these are all of the challenges that can necessarily come with that because our society was not built um, to accommodate or be inclusive at all times, sadly. So ableism is complex and pervasive, and I could probably do a two hour presentation on this slide alone with Mary and Livy of all of the implications of ableism and how it inter sex interacts and communicates with all these factors. And this is also on the handouts as well, but I just want to clarify that ableism is sadly structurally embedded <laughs> um, when you look at a lot of different things. And an example from my job that I encounter on a regular basis is MTA mobility. And at the end of this presentation, if you do not know what MTA mobility is, please Google it. <laughs> it's a great example of structural discrimination and oppressive for transportation. And it's just one example of maybe you can't use a normal bus or can't drive. And just understanding that there's a different system that has its own kinks and quirks. Culturally, we kind of discussed this throughout the presentation of discrimination and oppression, how people are looked at and how people are considered and stigmas and stereotypes, as well as the way they're treated, sadly. Um, medical, we're going to, I'm going to go into each one of these a little more in depth, but I'm giving a quick intro now. All I have to say about medical is Medicare and Medicaid. Even if you're not a social worker, half of the audience just went, <sighs> Because when you're talking about Medicare and Medicaid, they are wonderful welfare programs that come with a lot of intricacies, difficulties, and issues in terms of reimbursements, claims, um, actually getting the care, payment, etc. Financial, because you have to look at if you're getting social welfare programs, understanding that that could implicate taxes, that could implicate how much you make, and that could implicate paying your bills. Legal, because a great example is Disability Rights Maryland. They're an amazing nonprofit that does a lot of work with this and understanding the legal rights of having disability and being accommodated for in the workplace and health settings, etc. And finally, moral. Um, this can be religious and religions, but this could also just be in general of a stigma in society of how we are viewing individuals with disabilities and how sometimes that might be at a detriment to us and to them in terms of their self-esteem and to recognize that different is not bad. So ableist stereotypes and languages, I tapped into this a little bit, but I want everybody to think a little bit about this. What are some examples of stereotypes or language that you've experienced? Sometimes you might be acutely aware of it. Sometimes it could be colloquial or a casual statement and you don't even think about afterwards. Wait, like maybe I shouldn't have said that or maybe that could come off differently. And in the check-in, we wanted to share how the media uploads these stereotypes, whether print media, digital media, social media, thinking about how pervasive it is. And finally, in our education system, how we are teaching and with students, with individuals with disabilities, how they are shown. So kind of consider this as we go through the next couple slides. Okay, so I've talked about ableism a little bit. What does accessibility mean? And I just want to say that accessibility is a huge umbrella term. <laughs> just like a lot of these that can mean a lot of different things. So we're going to go into different definitions to help you conceptualize it better. Um, CAST has accessibility is shaped by what we need to do, our interactions with the environment and our personal preferences. And this is important because accessibility kind of think about it as an umbrella with different arrows. So it's how we interact with people. It's our values and it's what's around us. And then the second definition from C right here is accessibility is the practice of making information, activities, and or environments sensible, meaningful, and usable for as many people as possible. And to summarize that, it's basically being inclusive and making sure to be as inclusive as possible and always offer accommodations and support so that everybody can contribute equally. And for the self-reflection, kind of think about what accessibility means to you. Maybe you're somebody that prefers writing it down, maybe you prefer talking it out, but just kind of process what that term means to you. Okay, so like I said, I'm gonna go through a little bit examples 
for today. There's a lot more, but we just wanted to highlight some ideas that you could start thinking about. And there's definitely more that aren't on these slides. And for the self-reflection, we only have these five, but there's a lot more. So if you want to think about it, put it in the chat, think about how accessibility kind of pervades in your everyday life. Okay, so probably the most visible one is physical. Like when you say accessibility, a lot of times we have a mental picture of physical accessibility because it's just a lot of the way our culture and society has seen it. Whether um, physical, let's say you're driving somewhere, is there a handicap spot? Is there a spot for pregnant women? Like <laughs> Just thinking about being inclusive and recognizing that um, in terms of physical space, does the space have ramps? Um, can somebody with a motorized scooter or wheelchair get in? Are there elevators they can get through the floor? And finally, is there space for their wheelchair and scooter to maneuver? Like, can they get through the space without any problems? Um, virtually, this started in 2020 because of the mad shift from in-person to virtual activities, but has become such a part of our culture, especially with a lot of people working remote and hybrid. Um, this event has captions. Um, this event also has a transcript that could be made available and recognizing that um, it's important to see how that could be helpful. And for individuals that are deaf or hard of hearing, is there an ASL interpreter available to make sure they can be a part of the conversation too as well? Because for some captions might work, but for some ASL might be more beneficial. And then finally, educationally, and this is in terms of any point of school from young all the way up to professional programs are accommodations available for students who might need extra time, students who might need an interpreter, students who might need captions on videos, students who might need note-taking support, and not just students, but employees too. <laughs> employees in the educational system recognizing that they might need these as well, and that's totally fine, and just being respectful of that. And finally, I went through this a little bit earlier, but medical, Medicaid, and Medicare, sadly, a lot of providers cannot or do not take these insurances. And a lot of individuals with disabilities have these insurances because the way our social welfare is set up, those are financially the best and in some cases the only options available to them. So do they have healthcare accessible to them? Um, and finally, is there support for applying to SSI or disability welfare programs, so SSI, SSDI, um, and making sure that if they need assistance with these, because sometimes these applications are not accessible, <laughs> maybe having an individual assisting them with the applications or providing applications that are large text, braille, et cetera, just to make sure everybody can have no problems with filling it out. Um, and finally, financial, um, will individuals be penalized on their taxes or SSI for disability benefits? Because sometimes social welfare programs are amazing, but we don't think about the after effects that they might have. And the other one that I wanted to highlight that isn't on here is depending on your income, if you're, in, if you're two individuals with disabilities that are dating and want to get married, can you keep your benefits and get married is another really, really important question because some individuals cannot based on the ceiling threshold and recognizing that that in itself is kind of impressive and that you shouldn't have to worry about keeping your benefits when you want to marry somebody you love. So just considering that. Um, finally, the way we're going to kind of conclude this presentation is we've given you a lot of information, some of it's negative, some of it's positive in terms of ableism, disability, justice, and intersectionality. But how can we take the time to create accessible spaces in our own lives personally? and in our work lives for others, for allies, for individuals with disabilities, and just kind of take some time to self-reflect and think about what's a small or large thing you can do. We have some ideas to start, um, ideas for everyday accessibility. Um, virtually, like this presentation, there are captions available below. There are live transcriptions. Um, if an ASL interpreter is required, then that is something that could be arranged ahead of time. That way, the hard of hearing population would be able to communicate. Um, recording the session, which we are, so people that are late <laughs> or if they miss the event, they can still see it, making sure everybody has equal access. And finally, um, we shared our pronouns in the beginning and sharing your pronouns can create an inclusive space for everybody. So just being respectful of that. In person, um, this, so like I said, this kind of goes back to earlier, the physical and structural spaces, ensuring that if you're having a meeting room in person, that the restrooms and the meeting room is actually accessible and that somebody could get there. 
ramps, elevators, um, making sure the signage and directions are clear because whether or not you have a disability, if you just give somebody a map, that does not mean they'll know where to go. <laughs> so recognizing that they can actually get to the space and that the space is accessible through the map and there's no safety issues. Um, having a Zoom slash telephone conference for individuals who can't come in person. So recognizing that even though if you have an in-person meeting, life happens and being flexible. And if you're in person, you can either announce your pronouns at the beginning, but it might be easier to just have a flashcard or a piece of paper with your pronouns on it because that way if somebody comes late they'll just know what they are it'll be there the whole time and it creates a more inclusive environment for everybody i'm going to let mary finish us off and do the transition thanks dina um thanks y'all for for sticking it out with us I, like dana said we we covered a lot of a lot of topics um, at, a, at a pretty rapid speed. Um, so we really hope that this training has given you an opportunity to think critically about yourself and how you interact with disabled people and how you interact within an ableist society. Um, if you would like more information, please spend some time with our provided handout, which should be uh, which should have been sent out with. Um, with the presentation information or through the Office of Community Continuing Education. Um, really, ideally, the, the whole goal, right, as we've as we've already said throughout throughout this um, this presentation, is in order to offer like uh, affirming practice to disabled people and people with disabilities, we need to challenge, um, we need to challenge ableism in all of its all of its facets right in every way that it shows up which dana highlighted in terms of uh accessibility accessibility is a way to challenge ableism right and understanding how those two terms interact with each other and then disability justice is the lens that we take to understand all of that right recognizing that a person's disability does not fully define who they are and also has a really big impact on their life because of a disabling society, not necessarily because of a diagnosis that they've received, um, but also, you know, it's, it's all of those things combined. Um, and so that's disability justice is the lens that helps us to understand how we can challenge ableism through accessibility um, by normalizing these conversations, by centralizing the voices of folks with disabilities, um, and by being able to like have really important conversations and recognizing how oppression um, intersects with with other oppressions, right? Um, so thank you so much for sharing this time and space with us. Um, we are a little ahead of schedule, but I imagine we can take time to do um, some questions and, and answers before before we take a break and then we get to hand, <laughs> I almost just, I was gonna say it not, and, um, not in a funny way, but I hand the baton over again um, to Special Olympics Maryland, who's going to talk a little bit more about um, about the uh, their experience with, with ableism and, and the medical field. Um, so, I don't know if you need to see these references, but here they are. And I'm going to stop my share. And we can open it up for questions. If anyone has any questions, I haven't had a chance to look at the chat, but I can look in there now. I have a question. Yes. Um, I just was wondering if Dana, if you could speak a little bit more about, um, you said there's many different other ways that, um, um, like you had mentioned the financial impact, um, the medical and a couple others, but um, would social fall into like the social impact? And could you speak a little bit about that? I need to give context that this is my full-time job. <laughs> That's why I have a lot of information on this. As a supported employment specialist, I work with individuals with disabilities that are adults and I help them find jobs 
and keep their jobs once we have them. But for the individuals that are not currently working, we have something called a community development services program at Jewish Community Services, which um, is a social program that also communicates inter independent skills, um, teaches different life skills, et cetera. And one of the things that we have noticed not only in my job, but in my life is depending on how the disability presents, because sometimes it's visible, sometimes it's invisible, it can be very hard for individuals to communicate. Or they can communicate, but their needs aren't getting across. And probably the two best examples I can think of are individuals in the autism spectrum disorder sometimes know what they want, but don't always know how to say it. <laughs> Meaning maybe their communication will come off as crass or direct, which I personally appreciate because I would rather have that than not communicate at all or be too passive. But it can be an issue because an employer can then tell me um, something that they said was misconstrued or misinterpreted and they were really just being honest. <laughs> so that's one example of how social impacts on disability. And it's a really easy fix. It's literally just telling somebody, hey, you can think it, but maybe don't say it. Or maybe when you really want to say it, write it down or count to five. And then think about if it's still a good idea to say. And if you're not sure, the answer is probably no. And I don't think that's a disability, I think. I think that applies to every single person in, in this chat of maybe you won't want to say or think of some things that may not be so socially or societally appropriate at the time. So that's one example. And then the other example that I can think of, and this is not necessarily visible always, is it's easier to think about it in the communities that maybe somebody is hard of hearing, maybe they have a vision impairment, maybe they're nonverbal, and they communicate a different way. Our society is really based on communicating through typing and social media and talking, and those are not the only ways to communicate. Individuals that are nonverbal communicate with body language. Um, individuals that are deaf use ASL and there's nothing wrong with these, but the problem is the oppression and ableism in our society has considered these the second option, which frustrates me immensely because we don't consider speaking different languages a second option. I can think of three or four different languages right now that I do or do not speak. <laughs> that doesn't mean they're any different. It should be the same thing with the disability community. And I have three clients right now working at Blind Industries of Maryland, which is an amazing nonprofit, and they have sewing operators. Some have vision impairments, some don't, but I can't sew. They can sew a whole lot better than me. It's just an example of how there's nothing wrong with it. It's not bad. It's not negative. It's just different. And we need to kind of shift the lens on it. And I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. So I see, I see a couple of questions in the chat, um, Lydia asked if we could speak a little bit more about community integration, whether employment related or not. Um, I I assume that question might be for Dana, just considering Dana is an employment, uh, supported employment specialist. <laughs> um, um, and so Dana, if you want to answer, uh, if you want to respond to that, and, and I can talk about community integration if you want me to, too. I'll talk about the employment. You take the community integration and Libby chime in whenever. Um, in terms of employment, it actually really depends on the place. So I have clients in big box stores and retailers. I have clients in small businesses locally in Baltimore City and Baltimore County. And then you have clients that work from home. So it really depends on the context. But the one thing that I can say is that a lot of the retail and bigger businesses, the minute I come in and I say I'm a career coach, first of all, I don't disclose the disability immediately. There's literally no reason to. The only exception is like, one of my clients was blind. They were going to Blind Industries of Maryland. Kind of have to disclose that because it's literally a part of the job of the employer. But if it's not visible or immediately necessary for the safety or the goal of the employee, typically don't disclose the disability. It's really not necessary if you can do the job. I would only disclose it if it becomes a necessity or if you're concerned. Um, and then in terms of Sometimes supervisors and employees are really receptive and understand and call me and there's issues and we work it out. And other times they're really scared that I'm going to throw the ADA laws on them and sue them. And I'm like, I'm a licensed social worker. I'm not a lawyer. My goal is not to go after you and your business. My goal is to figure out what the communication issue between you and your employee is and help you work on it. So it's really similar to literally any other employment context. The only difference that I would say is I don't disclose the disability without the client's consent and approval and or if it is necessary for the position. And the only other thing that I would say about employment is everybody wants to work. 
we want to do different things. We want to make the money. Sometimes we want to make the money part-time and full-time and have benefits. And sometimes we just want to work around people. And it's my job is just being respectful. And I'll let Mary take the community integration piece. <laughs> Thanks, Dana. Um, yeah, Lydia, did you have a more specific question about community integration? My, I, I, I will let you answer that and then I'll tell you a little bit more. Uh, not so specifically, but I just wondering if you were going to cover it. Um, I work for as well, a nonprofit that provides community and employment and otherwise support. And, um, one of our big focuses is that we want them, we, we want to be able to provide community integration, whether or not it's working related or, or not, or just socially, you were uh, speaking about, um, you know, social integration and how we don't um, want to support, uh, you know, the separation of like, you know, 10 years ago or whatnot, if you saw, you, you know, uh, a group of people with disabilities or disabled people would go into the community altogether and they would just be in that one group rather than, um, making community more accessible and being part of your community uh, rather than just being, you know, all in one place separate from the rest of the community. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for your question, Lydia. I think that that uh, kind of like what what um, Samantha just put in the chat, right, um, about so much to un unpack about disclosure with employment um, and like what that means for ableism, you know, and how how we have to hide disability and how we have to be like afraid if an employer is going to discriminate against us because someone has a disability, right? Um, it's kind of it's kind of the same thing with the larger social structures. It, it, this is my opinion, also, <laughs> um, and I think that um, I think that the problem with community integration is that our society, like we've talked about throughout this throughout this presentation, our society is a disabling society, right? It's not set up to be accessible, not just physically accessible, but also um, for folks who are neurodivergent, for autistic people specifically, and for even folks with ADHD, right? It's really challenging. Um, it's really challenging uh, to deal with the co with constant stimulation, with communication barriers. Um, we uh, you know, it's part of, I, I think part of like the community integration piece is a challenge because uh, we assume that we put that pressure and that impetus on the on on the folks that we're serving, right? When really it's like our responsibility to make our society more inclusive um, and integrated. Um, there should not be uh, you know, when thinking about like um, special education classes, those classes should not be in the basement. Uh, you know, there's no reason for those classrooms to be any separate from every other classroom in the school. So that's just that's kind of like my my understanding. I don't know um, if we if we want to move on to a couple other questions, if that's okay. Or unless Libby, do you have anything that you want to add? I was just thinking about that, like the the moral piece, and was I'm I'm thinking about all these questions in the chat. These are great. Um, and that, that idea too about, you know, disclosing versus not disclosing. And I think that to speak to that like moral piece of ableism where there, if you, you know, are speaking about a disability, there's these sort of assumptions of maybe what can or can't be done. And I think that this might speak to the, to the UMB piece as well in terms of disclosing disability and not understanding the nuance to everybody's lived experience, like we've talked about. And um, I know, and I, I'm sure that we, we well, we might get into a little bit of that advocacy work um, with ASWB in terms of the accommodations process. But I think, and like people are, are mentioning um, education for everybody around disability, which I, you know, at a school is like, yeah, you know, like something that could probably be pretty easily implemented. But then, you know, trying to maintain that hopeful futures piece where it's like if we're working on that and building our understanding and our engagement with discussions about disability and ableism, how that could ripple out into our communities, especially as an institution of higher education, which already is very limiting in many ways, um, to be able to then hopefully create a container of that inclusion and better understanding within our walls to then be able to, to move out. Because I think um, like some 
folks are mentioning the um, even the accommodations process at school for both faculty and students. We've had conversations about this. Um, the amount of money that goes into proving certain things and the and that moral piece too of like why do we need to prove these things you know um to to create a, a an environment that everybody can be successful in so maybe if if that answers that previous question maybe we do move into kind of some some sharing a, around, uh, education at UMB. I, we'll be sure to make time for a bathroom break, um, so don't be worried about that. Um, but maybe we we do tap into that since that's where we are virtually right now. I completely agree. And the only two things I would add are I had to create a checklist of accommodations for the ASWB because the website was so confusing. I did it for free. I did not get paid to do it. It involved a lot of calls to the ASWB, a lot of aggravation of all the elections reward in the state process, and me literally walking to a post office and mailing it because they would not accept scams. Thank you for clarifying the ASWB, the Association of Social Work Boards, and if you want to get your social work licensure. And it's not just the ASWB. Go to literally any licensure board and pretty much any profession, and the same problem exists, whether it's nursing, medical. You have to work really, really hard to prove it. And the second thing we wanted to share is, so the school, and correct me if I I'm wrong for people that are at the school is developing an online like MSW option. Um, the, I don't know as much about this because this was brand new when I graduated, but I know that there are advisors working on it. And I say that and this exists because a lot of people, yeah, wanted the virtual option and it was something that was needed and it was created. And we actually created um, in our independent study a disability concentration idea, which it's for social workers, but it, a lot of it is really similar of people that want to focus in the disability space through either a clinical or a macro lens. And the whole goal of it was to basically have one or two classes on this. Like we already have an amazing developmental disability course that um, students should take and alumni I, there's a lot of resources if you're interested, but we just want to highlight how important it is and these a lot of things are being developed, but we're not there yet and we got to keep pushing. And I think too, it's, I was just pulling this up because I know um, Dean Schaefer, who is the Associate Dean for Student Affairs, recently sent out an email to um, there's faculty and and students about preparing for the LMSW exam, and so and I think in our December meeting that I believe is next week um, or the following week, I'll check that out. Um, but we're taking some time to work on that uh, the accommodations process and looking um, about at, at licensure together. Dean Schaefer will be joining us, um, and so I think to that point of, of um, kind of diversifying ways of gathering information, um, that, sh that should be on top of, of people's heads too, because I, I know that we're all very busy. And so sometimes um, those kind of impromptu conversations also can, can bring some very good information. How much time yeah. do we have left before we have a bathroom break? Just being cognizant. <laughs> okay. About five minutes. So you can probably take one more question. Um, do you want me to take Natalie's question on the licensure exam to end, or do we want to take another question? It's up to you guys online. I'm just um, trying to get caught up. Sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you to to um, Elise and Sarah for sharing a little bit about your experiences at the School of Social Work. Um, we like are we encourage these conversations, and I think it's really important to talk about like the mis uh, the misconceptions, right, about what accommodations are and are not, um, and recognizing that there are accommodations are are legal and necessary, um, right, and it's not a uh, it's not something that is um unjust or anything like that so thank you for for bringing those things up um and 
Um, Dr. Fold just said there's a question about the difference between inclusion and yes, belonging. I was just seeing that Chikina's mm -hmm. comment. Yes, and I think that is so important. Yeah. And um, you know, we have these now. I don't know if it's appropriate to say buzzwords or whatever, but about that diversity and inclusion. And um, to your point, that's a huge difference between inclusion and belonging. Um, and that's an important point to make. You know, there can be um, things done to make sure that disabled people are included in activities, but if that belonging is not there or it's not authentic, that's not that's obvious that and that's that's felt um as a lived experience and so i think um i think a lot i would for myself a lot of that comes that inclusion comes through relationship building and those conversations and being able to share time and space um with folks with disabilities, what does that look like to to feel included, um, rather than that, and, and engaging in that power piece too? Again, of like, oh well, what do I think? I, I'm holding this event. Like, what do I think would be good? You know, and to to seek out feedback um, is is so critical, um, and and happy to hear from other folks as well what what we think um, inclusion versus belonging because that is huge. I read something last night. Um, I I shouldn't say Reddit's a great example, but Reddit disability actually is amazing if you want to check it out. And this is probably my favorite example of inclusion versus belonging. Um, this was Australia and they had just had a baby and they were talking about the government's um, bag of like, thank you from the hospital versus the private sector and inclusion versus belonging is the private sector gave out free samples and gave them a bag and sent them home. And the government gave them a hat socks for the baby, a robe, <laughs> um, actual items, diaper cream. And that's the difference between inclusion and belonging. Inclusion is, here, take some free samples. Maybe you need this, maybe you don't. We'll offer it. Belonging is, we're actually listening to you. We hear that these are the items that you need and we're going to give them to you. And I really like that example of they juxtapose how the different social welfare systems helped in healthcare, because you can give somebody something, but if that's not what they want, or you do it with a reluctant attitude, or you're not really listening to them, you're not really being belonging. You're just kind of including them because you have to. If you're belonging, you're making much more efforts. You're trying a lot harder. You're listening and you're showing that you care. And even if you can't fully deliver, you're putting the effort in. And I think that matters. Yeah, thanks, Dana. And just to just to add to that, I'm the way that I, you know, I I work in private practice. I don't I don't work in a um, in a um, a larger organization anymore. Although that's what I used to do before I came to the School of Social Work. Um, I supported folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities um, in a supported employment um, office, similar to what Dana does. And um, so coming from a private practice perspective, recognizing belonging as a felt sense, right? An individual felt sense of belonging to a space and inclusivity as something that larger society and other folks can do to encourage a sense of belonging, right? And so like what I do with my clients in individual practice is to work on um, building community, um, uh, that is like accessible and affirming um, both of like gender identity as well as disability identity because both like interact with each other very intimately and like building that sense of belonging for themselves because oftentimes larger social structures are explicitly exclusive right so being able to recognize I don't know for, for me I understand inclusivity as a social thing, the larger structures of, of what we can do to be inclusive of and belonging as like a felt sense in relation to that inclusivity, if that makes any sense. That's that's my own understanding. And I think, again, thank you so much for bringing that up because I do think that this is in a lot of areas, a very nuanced question um, in terms of, you know, well wishes to be inclusive, but but still missing the mark and how that can sometimes cause um, and perpetuate that harm. Is I... Um... I recognize that it is 1021. 
I'm not entirely sure what our time cutoff was. I think it's 1020, but um... it's actually 1030. <laughs> but wow! we to start our break, but maybe we just have a bit of a, a longer break unless anybody else has some questions. Um, I posted the link to the handouts in the chat. Our presentation will be coming out along with those handouts. Um, please do reach out with any questions that you, other questions that you have and always looking to build community. So please, I um, our dream meeting is on uh, December 12th um, at 515. That information will be in the, the school bulletin and happy to, to provide that link here for anybody who's interested. And thank you again for being here. Yes, thank you so much, everyone. I um, we are so appreciative of of your attention and of your curiosity and compassion and softness towards this topic. Thank you for your questions. Um, like Libby said, we encourage you to reach out to us. We put Dana's email <laughs> on our presentation, and uh, if you have questions, you can reach out to Dana directly. Um, if you would like our contact information, we will be on this call for the rest of the meeting. Feel free to individually message us. We would love Libby. That's not my email. It's Copern.Dana. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just want to make sure it doesn't get bounced. It's my last name, not my first name at Gmail. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Libby's on it. So if if uh if we want to, we can take um a little break. What time do Lib? What time do we do we come back so we can to hang out with with Special Olympics Maryland and hear from them? 1035. Sounds good. Thanks, everyone.
Hi, everyone. We'll be coming back together in just another minute or so to get started with the next piece of our training this morning. So I'll give it just another minute while we get to 1035 and everyone starts coming back. And I see the conversation continuing in the chat. It's such a wonderful point, Susan. Um, and we really do encourage you to use the chat, ask questions, engage together in dialogue. Um, I know that'll be part of our next presentation as well. So let's uh, let's continue to have the conversation. You know, I think that, um, thank you to Libby and Dana and Mary so much this morning for guiding us through that conversation, kind of unpacking ableism and what it, what it can look like for us, um, particularly in, in our practice and our work as social workers. Um, and sometimes, you know, there's not clear and easy answers to all of this. Like, what do we do to, uh, to undo ableism? Um, and even just having these conversations and starting to introduce some of this language around ableism, around neurodiversity, um, I have certainly found in my own work and practice to be um, helpful in moving along the continuum and, and keeping us keeping us moving forward and maybe starting to get there to make some social change in that realm. Um, so before the break, we had the opportunity to explore ableism more deeply. And now I'm excited to introduce Adam Hayes, Faith McLucky, Kayla Shields, and Jason Schrimmel from Special Olympics, Maryland. This team reached out to us several months ago on a mission to educate current and future healthcare professionals in providing sensitive and supportive services for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So many of the athletes in their programs were sharing stories of being marginalized and mistreated in the healthcare system. And today you'll have the opportunity to hear firsthand about some of those experiences and how we can all do better at creating inclusive and affirming healthcare spaces. I just wanna name that the work this team is doing embodies social justice and concrete efforts towards meaningful change. And so we thank them so much for being here this morning. Faith, Adam, Kayla, Jason, take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. Fold. Hi, I'm Kayla Shields and I am the Director of Inclusive Health and Fitness at Special Olympics Maryland. And today we will be looking at the inclusive health and medical advocacy for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Let me share my screen and we will get started. Okay. So the mission of Special Olympics Maryland is to provide year-round sports training and athletic competition in a variety of Olympic-type sports for children and adults with intellectual disabilities. This gives them continuing opportunities to develop physical fitness, demonstrate courage, experience joy, and participate in sharing of gifts, skills, and friendships with their families and other Special Olympics athletes in their communities. Special Olympics is the world's largest sports organization for people with intellectual disabilities and was founded in 1968 by Eunice Kennedy Shriver. In Maryland, we currently have 4,340 athletes along with 3,233 young athletes. And here is the lovely panel that we have with us today. And Jason Shermer will be um, in the chat. So if you guys have any questions throughout the presentation, please just drop them in the chat, or if you would like to save them for the end and we'll answer all questions that we can. Adam? Thanks, uh, thanks Kayla. Uh, uh, growing up, uh, I lived uh, in and out of uh, the hospital due to a condition known as hydrocephalus or uh, water on the brain. This has resulted in having 34 major uh, brain surgeries uh, uh, and countless visits to the 
the hospital for checkups, tests, and more. Today, I have three shunts in my head and over 45 feet of tubing. My family and I have uh, had uh, many positive experiences uh, with the medical staff, especially because uh, uh, my neurosurgeon was Dr. Ben Carson. He and his uh, staff were uh, there uh, since he first saw me uh, at uh, three weeks old uh, and, uh, uh, and operated on um, me at five weeks old in all surgeries except for one from there on out. One surgery changed my perspective on uh, how I uh, was treated though, especially uh, with uh, how, um, uh, especially with uh, my intellectual disability. When I was 13, uh, I uh, went into the hospital uh, for one of uh, my uh, shunt revisions. This one wasn't as urgent. Uh, so they uh, wheeled me in uh, on a wheelchair prepped me, uh, Dr. Carson and his team had not arrived yet. Uh, but for some reason, they asked uh, me to strip uh, right in, in the middle of the operating room where everyone was. Then uh, they asked me to get onto uh, the hard operating room table. I was cold, confused, embarrassed, and my head was uh, in pain. I told the anesthesiologist uh, that, uh, that was there that I was scared of the gas mask. He started to put the gas mask on me and I asked him uh, to please give me a second. But, um, uh, but instead he forced uh, the gas mask on me. Even uh, while I was frightened. I felt uh, like rather than listening to me in my uh, needs as a patient uh, um, and uh, someone with an intellectual disability, he uh, just uh, wanted to uh, get the job done. After uh, the uh, surgery, Dr. Carson uh, heard about uh, what happened and gave uh, the doctor a lecture on uh, why you must listen to your patients. Uh, but this gave me more anxiety toward uh, operating rooms uh, uh, and being put under than I still have today. Because of my story, uh, I came uh, up with an idea that I uh, wanted medical staff uh, to learn how to uh, have better chairside matter manner and the ability to um, better listen to patients with special needs, especially during checkups or medical uh, appointments. In my experience, uh, medical uh, staff would rather look at patients or look at parents or uh, if they are uh, talking to someone with an intellectual disability, they are uh, talking in big words, not uh, breaking it down and not giving the patient the time to process and understand uh, what uh, is happening. I hope to change uh, that for the better with this presentation. So what do we uh, hope to achieve today? First, uh, uh, to learn uh, about uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities or IDD. We'll hear, uh, so we'll hear Special Big Maryland uh, athlete uh, testimonials. Um, we'll uh, learn about, um, we'll learn uh, about the uh, history uh, of, uh, the, uh, of uh, the healthcare uh, for those with IDD. Um, we'll look, uh, we'll, we'll look uh, at the health disparities uh, for uh, those with IDD. Uh, we'll identify various barriers uh, 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 to good health. And we'll listen, we'll learn uh, about Special Olympics health and inclusive health practices.
So just as a quick history of some athlete participation, the Special Olympics movement dates back to 1963 when Eunice Kennedy Shriver started a summer day camp for children and adults with intellectual disabilities at her home in Maryland to explore the capabilities in a variety of sports and physical activities. It was clear to her that people with intellectual disabilities were far more capable in sports and physical activities than many people believed. In 1968, the Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. Foundation sponsored the first international summer games held in Chicago, USA with 1,000 athletes with IDD from 26 states and Canada competing in floor hockey, athletics, and aquatics. The first International Special Olympics Winter Games followed in Colorado in 1977 with 500 athletes competing in skiing and skating. Since that time, the International Special Olympics game has been conducted every two years alternating between summer and winter games in the Olympic model. This past summer, Special Olympics USA Games was held in Orlando, Florida, with the Special Olympics World Summer Games being held in Germany this upcoming summer. Do you know that 6.5 million people in the United States have intellectual disabilities? An intellectual disability. So what is an intellectual disability? An intellectual disability uh, is characterized by significant uh, limitations in both intellectual functioning and in adaptive behavior, which covers uh, many everyday social and practical skills uh, and must originate before the age of 22. Um, uh, so, um, so this means uh, some individuals uh, may have uh, difficulty. Uh, understanding uh, so uh, um, understanding uh, what others say and mean uh, describing uh, what they mean or how they feel understanding social cues understanding uh, societal roles uh, handling uh, last minute um, last minute uh, changes uh, or a lack of routine, showing uh, and receiving of, uh, affection, and uh, filtering sounds, light, uh, lights, people, uh, or things moving. In 1990, the Americans with Disabilities Act was put into law and serves to improve the quality of life for individuals with disabilities by reducing social barriers and eliminating discrimination. Historically, individuals with IDD have been affected by disparities within the healthcare system. Recently, efforts have been made to limit these disparities by educating providers on how to improve their interactions and overall care for individuals with IDD. For people with intellectual disabilities, they are two times as likely to become obese, two to four times as likely to be less physically active, two times as likely to have cardiovascular disease and asthma, five times as likely to have diabetes, and on average have a life expectancy reduced by 16 years. And generally these deaths aren't caused by conditions that are biologically associated with ID, but are caused by other factors that are related to the healthcare. And the definition of disparity is differences in health which are not only unnecessary and avoidable, but in addition are also considered unfair and unjust. So some causes of health disparities are limited accessible prevention programming, such as education and counseling programming that promote physical activity, improve nutrition, or reduce the use of tobacco, alcohol, or drugs, and blood pressure and cholesterol assessments during annual health exams, and screening for illnesses such as cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. People with disabilities need public health programs and healthcare services for the same reason as anyone else does, to be active, healthy, and engaged, and an engaged part in the community. Another cause of health disparities is lack of provider training and curricula and universities on how to meet health needs. Another example is diagnostic overshadowing during exams. And diagnostic overshadowing has been defined as once a diagnosis is made, 
of a major condition, there is a tendency to attribute all other problems to the diagnosis, therefore leaving all other coexisting conditions undiagnosed. Diagnostic overshadowing occurs when a health professional assumes that a person with a learning disability is their behavior is part of their disability without exploring all the other factors that are contributing to the biological determinants. Another example is lack of knowledge, skills, and resources for, for, for providers. And the last cause, not only the last cause, but another example of a health disparity is complex health systems which restrict access, whether that be physical access to the building or restricting access to specialized care. Now let's take a look at some barriers that individuals with IDD may face when trying to access good health. Attitudinal barriers include stigma, stereotypes, and misconceptions related to having a disability. These misconceptions include ideas that people with ID do not understand or do not deserve the respect and cannot live a long, healthy life. For example, public health departments may not include people with ID in their own health promotion efforts based on their implicit bias that people with ID cannot improve their health, which we all know is not true. Um, communication barriers include ways in which communications are not accessible. Inaccessibility with communication results from the use of complicated words or technical language, long sentences, text-heavy forms, and words which may become too many syllables. Barriers can also include the lack of alternative formats, such as braille and large type for users with multiple disabilities. Policy barriers arise from the lack of laws and regulations requiring access or a lack of enforcement of existing laws. Policy barriers may only arise from the official documents of operating guidelines of the organization. Some examples include health insurance reimbursement policies that assume all people can be served in a 15 minute visit. Programmatic barriers arise when organizations fail to make reasonable accommodations to their programs or operations. Some examples may include inflexibility to appointment scheduling, insufficient time for appointments, meetings, or classes. Social barriers relate to the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, learn, work, and age are all known as social barriers of health. People with ID are more likely to experience these barriers than people without ID. These barriers include lack of financial resources, unemployment, lack of stable housing, and the experience of their personal uh, lifestyle. And lastly, physical barriers. This includes structural barriers that block mobility. These include steps or curbs, medical equipment that can require a person to stand or step, heavy doors or other spaces that require a person to reach the high or low points of their visit. People with ID sometimes have physical disabilities as well, which are impacted by these barriers. Inclusive health is founded by the idea that these disparities can be addressed by removing these barriers and appropriately including people with ID in the mainstream healthcare system, health promotion, and public health efforts. Sustainable inclusive policies and practices can be addressed, reduced, and often eliminated and eliminate many of these barriers. Inclusion allows for people with ID to take full advantage of the benefits of their same health programming and services experienced by people who do not have ID, resulting in improved health outcomes for people with intellectual disabilities. So uh, um, here are some communication uh, and boundaries uh, to, uh, uh, to help uh, understand. With behave, behavior equals communication. When uh, communication, uh, when communicating with someone with a, a speech impairment, uh, do not uh, uh, finish. Uh, do not finish sentences for them. Allow time uh, for uh, to process and uh, finish saying uh, what uh, they uh, would like to say. If uh, having a conversation and you notice that you do not have time uh, to finish, explicitly explain uh, this and let uh, them know uh, when you uh, when you can finish uh, the conversation at a later time. An example uh, uh, or 
Um, and also, uh, never uh, pretend to know uh, what the person is saying or agree uh, with something uh, you do not understand. Some things to remember uh, are to try to make eye contact with the person um, you are speaking with. Be aware of how fast you are speaking and use age appropriate tone. Um, some more communication uh, and boundaries uh, are to use your typical volume and uh, pace when speaking, but adjust when necessary. Take caution not to uh, perceive people with ID uh, as uh, uh, eternal uh, kids. Dependent people, uh, irresponsible or immature. Treat adults as adults and kids as kids. In some cases, you will uh, interact with a caregiver. In these situations, you uh, uh, make sure that uh, the patient is still uh, active, uh, an active participant and they are treated with dig dignity and respect. And with any other individuals, build and maintain a rapport uh, in order uh, to uh, be effective and establish trust. And, and finally, ask about uh, the patient's likes, dislikes, obstacles, past experiences, goals, uh, and more. Now we're going to take it over to Faith. Faith? Good morning, everyone. I love to be with people and spend time with my friends. Some people think I talk a lot because I said hi, and I'm friendly to everyone. But a lot of times, I feel left out when everyone's talking and I'm just quiet. Just because I'm quiet doesn't mean I have nothing to say. I have communication and memory difficulties. It takes me longer to think about and speak my mind. I wish people could take turns and give me more time to process what everyone's saying. Some people understand and will wait for me to get my words out. But some people don't know that I need more time. When this happens, I don't try to talk about I thought it would take too long. I would just say, I don't know. I want to, the doctor in real life with stomach pain, he pressed around his stomach and asked if it hurt. <clears throat> he asked questions so fast I can't not keep up. When I do not realize he may have thought not Nothing was wrong. <clears throat> Please 
don't do not assume a lack of response means nothing is wrong. <clears throat> it is hard to respond quickly. I would like people to realize I'm not quiet. I have things to say. I just need more time to say them. I hope everyone will understand and be patient with me. And give me a little more time so I can share who I am and what I am thinking. We all have important things to say. Thank you. Thanks, Faith. So, uh, um, the special, uh, so our Special Olympics uh, Health Initiative. Uh, special Olympics is uh, working uh, to increase uh, access to quality health care and prevention uh, and programming to improve uh, the health uh, status of people with ID. To address the health disparities faced by people with ID, uh, Special Olympics Healthy uh, Communities Program um, uh, infuses health uh, across uh, all aspects of uh, Special Olympics programming. It strengthens the capacity of existing healthcare systems uh, uh, and it uh, strives to uh, improve access to quality uh, health uh, care and pre preventative uh, health education for people with uh, ID uh, through the engagement of uh, partners, government, healthcare professionals, and activation of uh, local special fixed networks. Special Olympics Health is made possible by the Galazano Foundation and is working to ensure Special Olympics athletes can perform their best on and off the field and have equal access to quality health care, health education, and resources. The ultimate goal of Special Olympics Health is to improve the health status and increase access to quality health care and health care resources for people with IDD. Established in 1996, the Healthy Athletes Program was designed to improve athletes' health and fitness in order to enhance their ability to train and compete in Special Olympics. Healthy Athletes is made up of eight disciplines, including Fit Feet, Fun Fitness, Healthy Hearing, Health Promotion, Opening Eyes, MedFest, and Special Smiles. All of these programs are non-invasive screenings designed to offer additional support to our athletes at no cost to them and their families. Healthy Athletes is dedicated to providing health services and education to Special Olympics athletes and changing the way health systems interact with people with intellectual disabilities. Through free health screenings, training for healthcare professionals, and evaluation of health statuses of people with IDD, Healthy Athletes has become a powerful public health movement worldwide. Healthy Athletes events are often held alongside sporting competitions, and athletes can be screened in between games or after their event. Depending on the event, athletes can go through one screening with education or care, or they can go through up to all eight. After the healthy athlete screening, athletes will then receive follow-up care and referrals for local providers in their areas. All services are provided by volunteer health professionals and students like yourself. And data from these screenings are used in a multitude of ways in which some countries, pro this provides the only available data that they have of health for this population. So uh, um, with our uh, Special Olympics uh, health findings, uh, for every uh, 10 uh, athletes on uh, a U.S. Special Olympics team, uh, eight are overweight or obese. 
uh, and seven have significant problems with flexibility. Four need new eyeglasses. Two have some kind of eye disease. Three will fail a hearing test. Three, uh, three have low bone dis density. Three will have untreated tooth decay. And uh, one will need urgent referral to a dentist. This past summer, we had two healthy athletes events, one down in USA Games down in Orlando, Florida, and the other right here at Towson University in Baltimore County. So at USA Games, we had 125 Team Maryland athletes go through healthy athletes, and 83 athletes went through the strong minds component, which is the mental and emotional health component of healthy athletes. And at Summer Games, at Towson University, we offered four disciplines. We had special smiles, healthy hearing, fun fitness, and health promotion. We had 101 athletes that were screened, and we had a total of 213 screenings with 81 healthy athletes volunteers throughout the day. Uh, so uh, here's one of our healthy athletes uh, success uh, stories. Anthony is a uh, Special Olympics Maryland athlete who uh, traveled to Orlando, Florida this past summer for the Special Olympics USA Games. Here is his story. Let's try again. <laughs> and share. And we're going to share again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why is it doing that? Excuse the technical difficulties. <laughs> Let's try this one more time. You're going to scratch the video and keep going. <laughs> but the premise of Anthony Short's success story from Healthy Hearing this past summer was Anthony is a athlete who went down to the games for basketball and he has been deaf his entire life and they treated him with hearing aids and now he can hear and it was at the first time that he was able to do so at the screening this past summer and he was able to play his first game the next day with hearing aids, and it was the first time he, had able, he was able to hear the stands and everyone in the stands cheering him on, and it was his first time hearing his coaches talk to him while he was in the game, and it was just a joy to watch and to be a part of, and I was so glad to be able to be there for it, and now he is living his everyday life with the hearing aids that he had received from USA Games. But without healthy athletes, it would not have been possible for him to recognize the fact that hearing aids was an option for him, and he wouldn't have been able to get hearing aids without the help of healthy hearing and Starkey hearing aids who were able to provide the hearing aids for all the athletes down at USA Games. The So 
solution inclusive health. Within the field of social work, there are so many different settings in which inclusive health can be a part and is a part of your everyday lives. So social workers can work with people with IDD in so many different healthcare settings. It's in the hospitals, community clinics, private therapy services, home health care, and so many more. And they provide, among other roles, therapeutic interventions focused on mental and behavioral health, family support and education, case management and referral to and connection to services, behavioral support, setting up plans and systems to implement healthcare recommendations, home visits, advocacy, and so many more. So taking a look at the social work ethics and the six core values, we have service, social justice, dignity and worth of a person, importance of human relationships, integrity, and competence. And as a social worker in the field, you already know all of these ethics and six core values, but did you know that these six core values also connect with the mission and values of the inclusive health? Helping others in need, challenging social injustice, respecting the dignity and worth of all individuals, recognizing the importance of human relationships, being trustworthy, and practicing with competence and expertise. All of these are also great examples and fall directly in line with the mission of inclusive health and everything we are trying to spread today. So uh, here are four uh, key strategies of inclusive health. Uh, First, welcoming uh, spaces, ensuring your, uh, uh, ensuring your programs and physical spaces are accessible and welcoming to people with IDD. Incorporating disability etiquette, including for intellectual disabilities into internal staff training, speaking directly to the individual, not his or her companion, and letting the person finish before responding. If you offer assistance, wait for the offer to be accepted and for specific instructions. If you're not sure what to do, just ask. If you're having difficulty understanding a person, it's okay to ask them to repeat themselves. Operating under the assumption that people with ID are capable of making their own decisions. Exploring how using universal design, the design of services or physical environments to be usable by all without adaptation may be applied to your service or organization. And ensuring your space or programs are within compliance of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Where possible, ask if people with IDD, if there are any particular accommodations that may help them or best benefit them with your service. Next up, communication. Ensuring, uh, ensuring uh, your communications, including written and spoken language materials and interactions with the community are accessible to people with IDD. Use accessible language. Written material should be in plain language at no more than a sixth grade reading level. Language should get to the point and avoid jargon, acronyms, and abstract statements. Provide in-person assistance to ensure individuals understand materials and are able to complete their forms. Include images of people with IDD in your promotional materials. And materials should be available in other accessible formats, such as Braille or large type. Also, uh, uh, with awareness and training, understanding your community uh, and uh, tra uh, training your staff on uh, the barriers and challenges faced by people with IDD, including on how uh, to remove them. Train your staff and leaders on the barriers faced by people with IDD and methods for how to overcome those barriers. And hire people with IDD to provide input on and or to conduct the training itself. Um, sustainable uh, and uh, intentional uh, inclusion. Building uh, uh, intentional uh, and sustainable inclusion by uh, changing an organizational uh, culture to value and understand inclusion. Embed inclusion into your organizational culture. Incorporate disability rights and access into the company's policies and mission statements, including diversity statements. Incorporate inclusion into each program, service, or activity that you offer. 
partner with local disability organizations to learn how you can improve your inclusion practices, and include people with IDD in the planning, implementation, and evaluation of program services or activities. Or you can hire individuals with IDD to work at your organization in a meaningful capacity, both as a way of promoting a culture of diversity and inclusion, and as an effective way to increase awareness of the needs for your inclusion practices. So here's uh, two principles of uh, inclusive health. Principle one, equitable uh, access of people uh, with intellectual disabilities uh, to all health programs, services, and activities. Understanding the difference between uh, equality and equity is important and is a key component uh, to, be, uh, to both reducing disparities and successfully uh, including people with ID. Equity ensures that everyone gets the uh, same things and aims to uh, promote fairness. This can only be achieved if everyone starts uh, from the same place and has the same needs, uh, which is not the case for people uh, uh, from underserved populations, such as people with uh, ID. Equity uh, involves uh, understanding and giving uh, people uh, what uh, they need to live healthy lives. According to the CDC, health equity uh, is when uh, every person uh, has the opportunity to attain uh, his or her full uh, health potential, and no one is uh, disadvantaged in achieving uh, this potential uh, because of so uh, social position or other socially determined circumstances. Principle two, full participation for people with intellectual disabilities in all health programs serve and active. Organizational policies and practices should be integrated with accessibility and accommodations for all people with ID to allow for full and meaningful participation. To be inclusive, inclusive of people with IDD, their input should be requested and embedded throughout all aspects of the program's planning, development, and implementation. This is important in inclusion because people with ID can speak to their needs and provide applicable input to leading to the progress or success in a program and the objectives of an organization. People with ID can also aid in the evaluation of the program at different phases to support continuous improvement. We're going to skip that video since sound is not working today. <laughs> So inclusive health, Special Olympics is improving the health of people with ID by <laughs> prevention, prevention that through your health non athlete program, fitness program. Family health for and interventions to change behavior. Assessment. Uh, assessment uh, through our Healthy Athletes Program can uh, care uh, coordination and closing the referral loop. Training. Training of health professionals, ensuring they have the skills needed to care for people with IDD without bias. And finally, advocacy. Advocating for uh, health equity and inclusive health and funding and uh, policies to ensure people with ID uh, can uh, access appropriate programming and services in the same way people without ID can. Uh, 
Um, so, uh, call to action. How can you help? Uh, you can create welcoming uh, spaces, ensuring your uh, work environment uh, is accessible and uh, welcoming to people with IDD. Uh, communication, ensuring your uh, communications, uh, including written and spoken language materials and uh, uh, interactions with uh, the community are accessible uh, to people with IDD. Awareness and training, understanding uh, uh, your community and uh, training your staff on the barriers and challenges faced by people with IDD, including uh, on how to remove the barriers, and educating your entire team and re uh, reducing barriers. Emotional, environmental, uh, commun communicational, attitudinal, and personal barriers. Thank you so much for allowing us to be able to talk on inclusive health and medical advocacy today. We have, I had a great time. It was, it was and awesome. Jason, were there any outstanding questions? I have not had the time to check the chat yet. Right. Uh, nothing in the chat just yet. Well, if there are any questions, please feel free to throw out them in the chat, but otherwise. Thank you guys so much for listening and for being a part of our inclusive health training today. Oh, there we go. Okay, Kayla. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I would like to know how folks can get involved with Special Olympics Maryland. Yeah, there are so, so, so many ways that you all can get involved. We have local programs. So you can get involved wherever you are throughout the state of Maryland. And that can be as a sports coach, a unified partner, and within our Healthy Athletes Program, as a social worker in the field, you all would best fit within our Strong Minds component, which is our social and emotional health component, which takes a look at giving athletes the resources that they can take with them in their sports competition and outside of their sports competition to help them relieve stress, anxiety, pre-game jitters, um, meditation, breathing, yoga, stretching, all of that fun um, content that will help them be a better athlete on the field, but also help their everyday lives and have strategies that they can use outside of the sports field. And we do have a volunteer hub link that has all of our volunteer opportunities for all of our state competitions that looks like it has been dropped in the chat. So we post all of our upcoming sports competitions and state events into that volunteer hub. So if anyone's interested in checking that out, um, all the events will be posted there throughout the year. All right, there's a question from Maura and Faith. Um, would you be comfortable speaking to your experience in large groups when people are speaking so fast uh, and not leaving you time? Do you feel comfortable talking about that? No. <laughs> is it is it difficult? Yeah. What, what's the what's the hardest part? Um, like give people more time to um, respond, not if me and Adam or Kayla are talking in a group, it's hard to get our talking to Larger groups. Do you, like do you find large groups tiring? Yeah. Or? Yeah. A lot of stuff going on. <laughs> oh, great. Um, and then one more um, yeah. from the panelists. Is there anything that we should know 
about any experiences that they have had with social workers. Adam, have you had any experience with social workers? Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, uh, I've uh, the uh, closest I think was when uh, I uh, had a um, um, person to, uh, 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 person in. Um, I'm trying to remember. I'm sorry. Um, You're fine. Uh, um, um, when I. Uh, I guess even uh, in the hospital, uh, the closest to me that I've had to social workers uh, when I've had uh, uh, what is known as a child life specialist that had always uh, been there making sure that I was feeling okay uh, and uh, that uh, found ways to help me feel better uh, emotionally because uh, the stress of being in the hospital, uh, especially when you're uh, when all there's all those machines and all those doctors coming in, uh, uh, and uh, that that was a huge uh, part of my life uh, in the hospital is having uh, people like that that made sure that I was okay emotionally. So. Cool. Any any other questions? Cool. And yes, a quick plug to uh, the polar bear plunge that is happening uh, February 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. If you guys would like to take the plunge, we have dropped the link for the polar bear plunge in the chat as well. But I think that's everything if there are no more questions. So thanks again. And if you guys have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Oh, oh one more. One more question. Adam, this is to you. Um, when you talk about living and working independently, have there been any obstacles that you have faced? Uh, so one of those big obstacles uh, for me uh, is, um, yes, I'm uh, living on my own. I'm still receiving uh, a lot of help uh, from uh, my parents and all, all that, but uh, um, it's, uh, uh, I find that I want to, uh, by living more independently, I want to uh, find ways to um, to um, be able to uh, talk to others in my apartment, but uh, apartment complex. But they all uh, some some a lot of them seem to uh, go on with their busy lives, and you know, when they do try to talk to me, uh, they not all of them are. Uh, that uh, uh, take the time to listen to me. Um, another thing, I guess, with, uh, with actually living in my apartment is uh, the whole uh, um, trying to figure out uh, um, money. Uh, I uh, still receive a lot of help with that. And uh, then uh, when it comes to like, uh, if I have um, if I have uh, things that I may need help with with uh, uh, fixing in my apartment, uh, luckily I have uh, the uh, there's apartment uh, maintenance people. But uh, a lot of times when they ask me, so what can you point out to me? Like at this very second, what can you point out to me? Uh, what might be wrong? And I know it's there. I know what's there, but I don't really know how to describe it. So um, it's uh, those are, I guess, some of the uh, uh, stuff with living in an apartment. But uh, I've made it uh, with, with with additional help uh, from uh, from um, my parents and uh, others. Uh, I've been able to live. My eventual goal is uh, I want to uh, live. Uh, fully independently, but uh, but uh, I'm uh, doing uh, really well. I've been uh, living in my own apartment for eight years now. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, Adam. Yep. And Mackenzie did drop the Strong Minds link in the chat. We are currently looking for a clinical director to help us 
have uh, strong mind screenings at Special Olympics Maryland and be able to offer this as an opportunity for our events, for our athletes and at our events. So if anyone is interested, please check it out and please reach out. Or if you know of anyone who's interested, we would love to have you guys and to have a further conversation. But, cool. Thanks again. And I will pass, pass it back over to Dr. Fold and Dr. Shadima. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, um, Faith, Adam, Kayla, Jason, the Special Olympics Maryland team. Um, we did want to just take a moment. Firstly, if there are any other questions or thoughts that y'all have in the audience, please feel free to share them um, in the chat now. We do have a little bit of time for additional discussion. We also wanted to open up an opportunity for any of the presenters um, and panelists, both from Special Olympics Maryland and from the Dream Team, uh, to share any kind of final reflections or thoughts as we sort of wrap up this training. Anything standing out to you? Anything additional that you think might be helpful as we as we start to close out this morning? I just wanted to say thank you to Special Olympics Maryland, to Faith, Adam, and Kayla, and Jason um, for for your your work and your your support with us. I know that for me, I I haven't really been able to spend a lot of time with y'all, but I'm just like so appreciative of your presentation. And I had put this in the chat earlier um, that I uh, that y'all had answered a lot of the questions that were asked previously from our presentation, questions about community integration and and um, inclusivity and belonging. And I think that um, you really touched on all of those topics. And I think, you know, just to reiterate what, what we had talked about before, just to say again, that being able to have these conversations is so important and like a really good step towards inclusivity. Um, and I'm just like really honored to share the space with you all. That's, that's all I wanted to say. So thank you. Um, all I was going to add to Mary is faith. When somebody asked you a question and you said, I don't feel comfortable answering, I was smiling so hard because so many people feel like they have to answer every single question about every aspect of their life. And I just want to say thank you, Faith, for saying no and keeping your boundaries, but also to remind everybody, it's okay to be uncomfortable. It's okay to be like, no this is maybe triggering and traumatizing for me, or maybe I don't want to talk about this in front of 97 people on Zoom. And that is totally fine. If you do, that's awesome. Go off, keep living your best life. But I think in terms of Faith and Adam, what Mary Libby and I shared with everybody, it's important to not only keep your own personal boundaries within your own life, but also to respect whatever your client, patient, individual, whoever it is, they're not comfortable, don't push it. <laughs> they it's just we got to respect what they want to and I also want to say to Faith and Adam thank you for being courageous enough to say no because that's also a big issue in the community where people and Adam your story was so powerful we feel like we have to say yes we don't we do have autonomy and the power to say no and respect our boundaries Yeah. Also, another thing I wanted to say, Dana, now that you mentioned that, I think that like talking about consent is really important for us as clinicians, as social workers in discussing like what is consent, right? And like if there is not consent for care um, in like the medical field and also in like in the mental health field, if a person does not want to talk about something or if a person is not consenting to a specific um, medical procedure, like you had talked about and shared, Adam, right? I think it's really, really um, imperative and necessary for us as practitioners and people who are in caring professions to respect and honor that consent and respect and honor those boundaries. Um, so thank you for giving the giving us the opportunity to think about that. And I, you know, I encourage all of us social workers and anybody else in the field to really um, to centralize uh, that consent. Thank you so much, Mary and Dana. 
Any other thoughts from uh, other presenters and panelists? And Joan, I see your comment about, um, you know, the unanticipated positive of the pandemic has been the adoption of virtual mental health services and telehealth services, which has provided much greater accessibility for many, many people. Um, and hopefully that continues to be something that is supported by our systems. This is not necessarily about the presentation, but it's just a plug for where I work, but also in general. I'm actually not a clinical social worker. I'm licensed, but I'm more macro. And I'm saying that because if you want to be a therapist or do emotional health or mental health services, and you can work with individuals with disabilities, I've had seven different people call me in my office, in my building, being like, can you do therapy services with this client? And the answer is no, because I'm a case manager. <laughs> And that would be a boundary ethics. But I just wanted to share, if you are interested in clinical work or therapy or mental health work, and you have a passion for individuals with disabilities, not only will you have a job, there are so many people that will thank you. <laughs> There's jobs needed on both sides everywhere. But I just wanted to share that a lot of the, I hate the word marginalized and underrepresented. So I'm just going to say, um, populations that don't get as much care, because I think that's the least negative statement. If you want to work with individuals with disabilities, neurodiverse individuals, LGBTQ plus individuals, there's a dearth of caseworkers, case managers, and therapists, and the field needs you. And I'm sure everybody on this call who's either worked on the clinical or macro or any side of individuals with disabilities recognizes that this is not only a field with opportunity and jobs, it is an incredibly emotionally and fulfilling field. So for alumni, for students, think about jobs in this sector. Thank you so much, Dana, Dana and Marianne, to elevate your comments. Um, yes that the the changes and how we approach work with people um, with disabilities in general and certainly with IDD needs to um, needs to include people of of all ages 100 percent I know that something from the presentation that really stood out to me was faith when you in your presentation stated that um, Sometimes when you are not given processing time, you'll just answer a question by saying you don't know. And that doesn't mean you don't know and it doesn't mean that you don't have a response or something to say. And as providers, it's incumbent on us to notice the dynamics and realize when that's happening and when we're not giving people the time and the space to really process and share. So thank you for that. That was a big, a big takeaway um, for me is something that I need to think about and process, process more as a social worker. Any additional thoughts or comments before we wrap up for today? All right, Corey, I will turn it over to you for our closing. Thank you very much. Um, and um, I actually want to share um, three small, th small, big thoughts or, or comments as well. And I'm just, um, in addition to my gratitude um, to all of the panelists, not only in what you heard today, which speaks for itself, but all the work that went into planning this, the meetings to ensure that, you know, this would be a well-rounded presentation. And, you know, the panelists also really thought a lot about you know, our audience and what you all might like to hear. So I want to, you know, add that and elevate that as well. So, um, you know, my three takeaways, I think, are I was just really, really struck by how important time is, right? Um, and I heard that all throughout, taking the time to listen to each other, to think about what we ourselves want, and taking the time to be in dialogue with each other. Um, I heard that as a message loud and clear, but I also felt that, you know, as we shared this space together. Um, and um, I think we need to think a lot about that because that's a larger societal issue. The other thing I wanna say as a person who is a researcher, and I tried to intimate this in my opening, but I, I wanna really underscore it um, and be very explicit, 
is we talk a lot in social work about evidence-based practice, and there are debates about each element of that, right? We talked a lot about words and how they matter. What is evidence, right? What is evidence-based and what is evidence-based practice? And I really want to underscore that for me always, um, experience is evidence. So what everybody shared today from their lived experience, what you shared about being practitioners, um, that is evidence. And um, so I appreciate you sharing that. And I think we need to remember that that is a crucial part of what we are thinking about when we're trying to understand something or thinking about make a change that lived experience is and should always be underscored and considered as part of the data, the information that we are gathering. Um, and the third thing, and a few of you had said this, I saw this a lot in the chat, there was a lot of thank you for people trusting us with your stories. Um, I also saw in the chat people sending out, you know, corrections or highlights. So also trusting each other that it's okay to make a comment and say, hey, I am thinking differently about this. And just that whole dialogue to me, this whole space has been a lot about trust. Um, and trust also means when people trust to share their stories or their opinions, that also means that um, you all must have some optimism that we all can be better and do better. And so the trust um, that comes with that piece of optimism that we can um, is also a gift that you are giving um, to us in the learning. Um, so I just wanna close with those thoughts. I wanna thank the very engaged audience that we have as well, I am saving the chat with all of the wonderful references and resources um, that came in here. And so if we do send anything to all of you, um, we will compile those and share those as well. Um, thank you to everyone. Um, and um, yeah, thank you. <laughs>